John 19 for our sermon. You can listen to me read it, or you can turn to your Bible or the uh, hymnal, uh, hymn pew Bible. I'll get the word out. We're in the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We are reading 19 to 22 and 30 to 31. John 20. Sorry, I'm in the wrong book. 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Down to 30 now. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Amen and amen for the reading of God's word. A Sunday school teacher once asked her class to write one sentence on what Easter means to me. One student wrote, Egg salad sandwiches for the next two weeks. Maybe that'll be you. It will be us, probably. Another Sunday school teacher once asked, why do we celebrate Easter? The children gave a variety of answers. Because the Easter bunny, Easter eggs, candy, spring. And then the teacher said, no, those are Easter traditions and symbols. But what is the reason why we celebrate Easter? What happened the very first Easter? A little girl raised her hand and said, Easter celebrates Jesus coming out of the tomb. The teacher exclaimed, yes, excited that the correct answer finally surfaced. Proud of herself for having the right answer, the little girl continued. Then Jesus looked to see if he could see a shadow and if, he, if we were going to have six more weeks of winter. <laughs> it's hard to keep it all straight for little ones. But it's not the Easter Bunny's birthday, it's the resurrection of Jesus Day. And, you know, I I love to celebrate the rabbits and the colored eggs and the symbols of spring. And those traditions come from history. And nobody's quite sure where the name Easter comes from. Some say it's from an ancient Germanic calendar. Another word uh, for Easter in German, um, in the German calendar, the word for April is actually Easter. Um, Others connect it to ancient feasts and other gods, but we celebrate Easter for a very specific reason, and that's the resurrection of Christ. Let me see if my screen is up. Yay. And so today, I want to look at what the difference it makes in our lives that Jesus is alive. So Sunday morning, following the Passover, Jesus met on Thursday night, if you recall, Maundy Thursday for the Passover meal with his disciples. And then he went to the garden and prayed as if blood was dripping from his forehead out of knowing what would happen. And then on Friday, we know that he was beaten and a crown of thorns was placed upon his head and he was crucified in that Roman manner of crucifixion. But what difference does it make? Because two days later, he rose again. What impact does it have on your life? Does it make a difference? Do you, are you able to articulate what difference the resurrection makes to you? 
I'm going to give you three easy ways to say what difference it makes to you today. What difference the fact that our Jesus is alive and we are believers in him and when we are called to give an account of why we believe or why Jesus is alive and what purpose it serves in our lives, we have three easy answers. Hold on. Says it's on. I think it's asleep, Bill. Says it's on, but can you there oh, something happened? Can you hit it? The first point is <laughs> it was a really nice slide too. Um, I have peace. Have you ever heard the story of how Gloria Gaither wrote Because He Lives, which we're going to sing in just a minute, and Eva played it before worship. She was Sitting in 1960s, expecting her first child, they were musicians, songwriters, going through a terrible time in their lives personally. Bill had been seriously sick. Their music had been criticized for not being serious or spiritual enough. And on New Year's Eve, Gloria Gaither sat at her table and she says, I sat alone in the darkness thinking about the rebellious world and all of our problems and about our baby yet unborn. Who in their right mind would bring a child into a world like this? But then something happened, she said. I can't quite explain what happened in that next moment, but suddenly I felt released from it all. The panic that had begun to build up inside gently was dispelled by a reassuring presence and a soft voice that kept saying, don't forget the empty tomb. Don't forget the empty tomb. Then I knew that I could have a baby and face the future with optimism and trust, for I had been reminded that it was all worth it just because he lives. Out of that experience, she wrote the lyrics, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. So the first thing that we know that we can take from this story is that we have peace. We know the end of the story. And the first words out of Jesus' mouth when he walked into the room that night with the disciples was, don't be afraid. Whenever something supernatural happens, sometimes we have to say, don't be afraid. It's okay. Have peace. We can have peace. It means wholeness. Shalom is another word for it. Just an absence of war doesn't necessarily mean peace. Peace means you're reconciled. Peace means that you're one with God who breathed life into the universe. And I've preached a lot of funerals. And one thing I know is that when people have a funeral, they often will say, well, that person found peace. Or we pray that that person finds peace. The truth is we can't find peace. We can't gain peace. We have to get it from Jesus Christ. We're not in a position to make peace because we are separated from God because of our sin. God came and walked with us, came as a human being to make a bridge so that his death upon the cross would be able to connect us with the Heavenly Father. Jesus said, I've come that you would have life and have it to the fullest in John 10, 10. He also says, I have come that you would know God. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. So you can't just 
make peace, you have to have it given to you by God through Jesus Christ. Number two, I have a purpose. Okay, I have a purpose. How do I know that? In one of the verses, John 20, 21, it says, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I send you. Our purpose is to be sent. If you don't know what you're going to do when you grow up, I can tell you one thing that you're supposed to do. Represent God. Represent Jesus. Have a purpose, an overarching purpose. Your life means something. You're not just taking up space. You're not just waiting out time. You can be the life and the feet and the hands of Jesus, and you are indeed called to do that. If one looks at this verse, you have a purpose. I came and I'm sending you, is what Jesus says to the disciples, who were probably pretty uh, scared and a little um, hesitant at this point because Jesus was in his glorified body. He had not ascended to the Father yet. They had seen him die. They'd seen him be speared in his side, but yet he walked into the room. I bet their mouths were dropped. And they were given this task to be ambassadors for Christ, to testify to the power of the cross and the promise of eternity. We all ask these big questions of life. Where did I come, up, come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Jesus can help you find meaningful answers to every one of those questions. The search for meaning of life has puzzled people for thousands of years. Because we start at the wrong place. We start with ourselves. We ask self-centered questions like, what do I want to be? What should I do with my life? What are my goals, my ambitions, my dreams? That's the wrong way to look at it. Turn it around and say, what does God want me to do? What is my purpose in light of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross? It is about him, not us. And you will only find true fulfillment in this life when you are responding to Jesus' call to be what you are to be in his plan, in his universe, in his thinking. It's all about him. Christ, the invisible image of the invisible God, was created before everything else and is supreme over everything else. He created everything in and through him and for him. Because of Jesus, I know why I exist, why I'm supposed to be here on earth. Because he lives I have purpose, and I have promise of eternal life. And that leads to the third point. Let me try one more time. Okay, I was going to go backwards, but I can't. Okay, we'll work on that another day. I have promise. I have peace. I have purpose. I have promise. There's your answer, folks. Write it down. Keep it in your head. Somebody asks you, why do you believe this? Or what's Easter mean? Well, because he lives, I have peace. I have purpose. I have promise. Say it with me. I have peace. I have purpose. I have promise. At the end of the encounter with Jesus, John tells us that these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the promise of the very famous verse, John 3, 16, 2, also that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And I said it before, all through Jesus' life, he came to give us abundant life. Abundant life. And that is life that has no end. 
that when we shed this earthly shell, as believers, we continue to live in his presence. The promise of life everlasting is the heartbeat of hope. And the resurrection of Jesus ensures that we, too, will be resurrected. Think of it this way. A Muslim in Africa became a Christian, and some of his friends asked him, why have you done such a thing? And he answered, well, it's like this. Suppose you were going down the road, and suddenly the road forked in two directions. You didn't know which way to go, but there at the fork were two men, one dead and one alive. Which one would you ask for directions? The dead man or the alive man? Food for thought. Easter is so much more than candy and colored eggs and cartoon bunnies. Easter is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. And that's what today is all about. That's why we're here. That's why the building is here. That's why we have the celebration. That's why we have the musicians, the church members, the preaching. And we're here for you. God loves you more than you and I can ever know or realize. He gave his one and only son so that we could live forever with him. Apart from him, we die. If you need to experience the power of Easter, if you need to have peace with God, a purpose for your life, and a promise of heaven, please consider it. Think about it. While we sing, because he lives, that is hymn number 213. As Keith comes to lead, I stand here to pray with anybody, to welcome you, to answer questions, or even after the hymn's over. Because he lives, and listen to the words that we sing, and think about Gloria Gaither and what she was thinking about when she wrote them. Thank you. 213. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died.
the best news I've ever heard. I have peace. I have a purpose. I have promise because he lives. Join me in the benediction printed in your bulletin as we read together. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. He has a purpose in your being there. Christ who dwells in you has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in his grace and love and power. You are loved. Happy Easter. Bye-bye.